Welcome back to 3D Printing Essentials. I'm Chris Iverson, and again, this is Emmett Lalish. And we're going to now put all the pieces from these modules together for you and do a full end-to-end uh, -end 3D printing uh, demonstration. Uh, so Emmett will start here in 3D Builder, and we'll walk through uh, what the 3D printing looks like, uh, what all the options are, and you can actually see the 3D print start. And then we'll go through and talk about the technology, uh, what's, what the important pieces are, and what we're doing in this space. All right. So... Um, in 3D Builder here, I've got uh, loaded up from the last time um, a, a model of mine, my uh, secret heart box. We're hoping to print something um, that'll, uh, that'll work nicely here. We've already repaired it, um, so that's uh, an essential part to make sure that the, the slicer can handle it. But now if we want to print, from 3D Builder at least, we just uh, slide up the app bar, hit the print button, and here we see our PrinterBot Metal Simple shows up because that's plugged into this machine um, by USB. Um, so you click on that and we bring up this sort of 3D print menu. So we have a choice here of a quality setting. Um, right now this basically selects different uh, uh, layer thicknesses. So you can try to do sort of uh, thinner layers or thicker layers depending on whether you want to go like a draft will give you um, a faster print that's a little bit lower resolution. Medium is pretty nice. Density refers to the infill. So um, for the solid parts of this print we can basically choose to print it completely hollow with no material inside of the perimeters at all. We can print it completely solid, um, which actually is, is relatively rare that you need that, but maybe for like a really structural part. But most of the time, you want something in between, where it just sort of gives it enough fill to basically give it some support, but not take a lot of time, not take a lot of material. Um, and we default to low, because that's actually um, gives about 10% infill, and that's great for most parts by yeah. far. Um, you have the choice of turning on or off supports. What's the support? So... Basically, when you, uh, when you build a 3D object with one of these FDM-style printers, um, the overhang is important. So if you're trying uh, to print something that, um, that, that overhangs very steeply, like, uh, like say you wanted to print like a, a spheroid, um, like we have here, the difficulty you'll have is on the bottom, it comes out almost horizontally, and the, each layer, the print has to lay down on top of a piece of plastic below it. So if you overhang too much, these edge pieces will be over nothing, and they'll just tend to fall down and, and look ugly, and the, the print can fail. Um, a way that we have around that is if you turn on supports, then the, the slicer, the driver, will actually automatically build a structure underneath it designed to support those parts that are overhanging by too much. Um, and then the hope, at least, is that you can kind of pry that support material away afterwards um, and, and be left with the part you want. Um, now, realistically, that process is always imperfect, so it's nice to, have, to, to print without supports if, if you can, but for objects that require it, this is a really useful op option. Um, the raft is another thing that you can choose, and um, this raft setting is, is kind of related to supports. A lot of times they're used together, and basically if your print bed is warped, um, then it can be very difficult to get that first layer to stick properly everywhere because it could be too high in one spot and too low in another. Um, and so the raft basically puts a big thick layer of plastic down first that sort of takes up any weird warping in your bed and gives you a nice flat place to start from. And again, you can, when you're done printing, you kind of pry that off of your object. Um, so those are all options here. But um, I'm, I'm happy with this setting of uh, medium quality, low density, and I can click print. And then we get this little dialogue that's sent to the printer, and you hear over in the corner that the printer has immediately started moving. Um, so it's now going through its warm-up operations. It's heating up the print head now. It's going and testing the print bed to make sure that it, um, to figure out where level is, where the heights are. And then basically we're just going to have to wait for it to reach 230 degrees at that nozzle, and then it'll start printing this object. So that started printing. Like I mean, it started the printer up right away is that new something new because I, I i've known in the past that my printer will take some time uh, from the time i slice it until it starts up that's exactly right so um you know this is this is our own slicer developed in-house uh it's very much in production um it's very much under development we're adding things to it daily 
And one of the things we're really trying to push for is to make slicing not only accurate, but fast. Um, and in addition to that, we noticed that at the beginning of a print, you basically always have to wait for the nozzle to heat up. And that takes a couple of minutes. So that's a really good time to get the slicing done. So what we've basically changed here is that the printer can start heating immediately, wait for the object to slice, and by the time the printer is ready, the, the sliced file is all done and ready that's for awesome. the the code. That's great. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the value of the slicer and what Microsoft is doing there? Sure. So the slicer is, is really the key element of uh, the 3D printing process because, you know, you go as a designer through all this work trying to build an, an accurate 3D representation of, of what you want, but then you just want to click print and have the printer do it. Well, the simple fact is the printer doesn't know how to just make a 3D object. The printer simply moves in sort of X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, it's actually a very simple device. It's just told sort of where to go and how fast. Um, the process of going from a 3D model to that, um, what we call a set of tool paths, the actual uh, path that that nozzle will trace to create the part is what we call slicing. And it's a very complex process because Fundamentally, there's like an infinite number of ways that you could do it for any given 3D object. Um, you could design paths all kinds of ways. I mean, like a very simple way would say you could just roster back and forth like a lawnmower on every layer. And technically, that would create the 3D shape that you asked for, right? But it turns out that will give a very low quality 3D shape because every place that you turn around, you'll get sort of a little nubbin and the outside of your shape will be very rough surfaced. Um, that sound you're hearing is the printer has gotten up to temperature and is now starting to print. Um, so uh, it turns out there's lots of different ways to actually go about printing. And we've tried to make this higher quality by, for instance, you see here it's printing the perimeters first. So it'll print these nice smooth perimeters that represent the outside of the shape, and then it will do the rostering infill afterwards um, that will be sort of hidden internally. Um, there's so many little tricks like that that are involved in making a good print. Um, and there are many slicers available, and they all do things a little differently. Some are better at some things, some are worse at other things, and we're trying to basically um, advance the state of the art, add our own features, uh, and make it so that even more objects are printable, you get better results, more consistent results, um, all that kind of thing. Um, and this all comes back to it being really essential that the incoming models are, are manifold. This is why we check that thoroughly in 3D Builder and actually stop you from printing if it's not, uh, if it's not manifold. Um, we give you a repair service so you can fix it. And, and that's really essential to making sure that the, the slicer can, in a, in a guaranteed way, give you what you expect to, to have as a result. And, you know, here on this slide, you can kind of see the kinds of results you can get when things go poorly. I mean, this could be a slicing error or it could be a hardware error. It's, it's impossible to tell from here. But this was somebody's bust that has just fallen apart and turned into a pile of noodles. And this is all too common in 3D printing when, when something goes wrong. This is what we're trying to avoid. So, you know, some more examples of, of what's important about a slicer, you know, this is a case where software can really make up for hardware. Um, there are problems and limitations in the hardware, um, but it turns out that it's much cheaper to fix these things via a clever software solution than to totally change the design of, of the extruder or the, or the gantries. Um, so, like, you know, one example is um, if you have a very small object, like narrow and cross-section, it can actually get too hot and start to slump as it's printing because you're pouring heat into it from the extruder. It turns out that if you slow down on those small areas, you can allow the cooling air to actually have more effect and it will properly uh, allow it to harden before the next layer comes in on top and, and pushes it around. So uh, that can be really important. There's lots of other things um, that can matter as well. like. Um, the uh, extruder has a tendency to, to dribble out. Uh, maybe you saw that on an earlier video. If it's just sitting there hot, the plastic will melt and just kind of pour out of it slowly. The problem is, if you tell it to stop extruding and move over to a new place, that's not going to happen immediately. 
um, and it will tend to leave a little string of this sort of oozing plastic uh, that will make the part a lot uglier. You'll have to trim all these strings off when you're done. Uh, one way that we fix this is by retracting the filament rapidly before you move and then pushing it back in when you start to print. Um, and that can kind of make up for these, these problems with the, the extruders. Um, another classic problem um, that, you know, these, these previous two are pretty well known in, in current slicers, but but one that's a little less uh, commonly dealt with is that if you try to print a very small arc, like a small circle, um, you can end up creating a lot of acceleration for the print head, trying to whip around that small shape. And there's only so much acceleration that a robot can, can handle before it will simply, you know, the motors can't keep up. Um, and so it turns out that if you can find the radius of these corners and reduce the speed accordingly, then you can limit that acceleration and make sure that the print will actually uh, finish properly. Um, and that's something that we're working on implementing now. So tell us a little bit about why this, you think this is such a hard problem. Well, fundamentally, there's just a lot of steps to slicing. Um, we talk about it like it's just one process, but it's, it's really this huge flow chart. Um, and this is actually just sort of a minimal set um, of, of things you'll have to do in, in, this, in this slicing driver. Um, there's a lot of other boxes that could show up in here as well as you try to get more. You mentioned features. you mentioned cooling and the arcing and that sort of stuff. Right, exactly. Um, but fundamentally, these are all fairly complex um, geometric algorithms, and you're coming in with models that can easily have a hundred thousand, a million faces. Um, if you're looking, especially like scan data or something that's really meant to be um, a smooth, curved object, you have to represent it with a lot of faces, and so the. Uh, basically the algorithmic complexity becomes really important. Uh, if you don't write these algorithms really well, you can run a machine right out of memory. Um, you can take a really long time to actually get a slice done. So we're going to have to basically make sure that we're being um, very careful, um, able to deal with parallelization, able to use the GPU, all kinds of important stuff to get adequate performance. Now all these, in all these cases, you're really talking about a lot of performance being used by the desktop. And I know that a lot of my friends are excited right now about 3D printing from their, from their mobile devices. Is that, is that something you see happening? Yeah, exactly. What I think is going to happen is, you know, it's true that the mobile device probably doesn't have the computing power to actually do the slicing on board. But then again, the mobile device probably isn't plugged into the printer either. Um, so what I envision probably happening is you could have a, an app on your phone that says, I want to print this object and then it can send it up to a cloud service and you can actually do the slicing in the cloud or on whatever machine is actually physically attached to the printer. Um, and of course, this is exactly what happens in the case of a print bureau, like if you've ever used Shapeways or something. You send your object up, they do all of this slicing, but you never really see it. It's happening on their end. Yeah. They just send you the part in a box when it's all done. Uh, so manifoldness, we've talked about how the importance of repairing your model and making sure it's manifold. Can you go into a little bit more detail about, uh, about that? Right, so basically, um, Manifoldness, it's also often called water tightness. Um, it, it, the definitions vary based on what sort of situation you're in, but for us in 3D printing, what really matters is this mesh has to represent something solid. Um, if you're looking on this slide, uh, on the left here, we have an object that's, that's not manifold because it doesn't represent a solid. It's a, it's a series of sort of spherical shells, but but what is the inside? What is the outside of this object? If I were to try to print it, what, where would the printer put the plastic? It's really not clear. It, it is a 3D shape, you can see it, but it doesn't really represent anything physical. Um, and it turns out a way to ensure that that's not the case is that every face has to share exactly, um, every edge has to share exactly two faces. And that basically makes sure you don't have those open ends uh, to a shape. Um, and then likewise, uh, there's sort of a more detailed mathematical anomaly uh, called a Klein bottle, which is basically like a three-dimensional idea uh, concept of a Mobius strip. Basically, the inside is the outside. and we, We've got a picture of one of those on the right. And that's another thing where, okay, every edge shares two faces, but it's not like a possible physical thing. 
Um, so the way you want to do that, uh, the way you can make sure that that doesn't happen is you say that every face has to be oriented consistently with its neighbors. Um, and that basically means a Klein bottle is unorientable, it's known in mathematics, so uh, that will ensure that you don't by chance have a Klein bottle, which again has no inside or outside. So basically that's what our, our manifold check checks for. And one of the problems we've run across is that um, the most common file format out there for 3D printing right now is STL. And you know, it's this, it's this 30 year old open standard and everybody uses it because it's just been around forever and it's simple. But it has some fundamental problems, which is that it stores the faces separately and it ends up with what we call triangle soup, where there's really the, the topological information of how these faces are actually attached to one another is totally lost in the format. It, it doesn't keep that information at all. Um, and so you're trying to reconstruct this manifold by figuring out what triangles are next to each other and hooking them up. And you can actually end up with, um, even if you had a model that was manifold and you saved it as an STL, when you open it again in another application, it might not be manifold anymore, just because of rounding errors and really common um, mathematical issues that are fundamental in computers that can actually break the thing that's most critical to us. So. Um, as a response to that, we developed our own file format that's intended to be, instead of for 3D graphics, really specifically for 3D manufacturing. Um, and so this is called the, the 3MF format. Um, and basically, this is, uh, it's a compressed XML, and it, importantly, it does store the mesh topologically. So you, you keep this manifoldness um, built into the format is a very specific definition of manifoldness and what and, and you, you actually um, are required to adhere to that. Um, and basically anything that loads a 3MF is gonna check for that to make sure that it's valid. Um, uh, we have support for colors and textures and materials, but not things like lighting and fog that are important to rendering, but have no utility, no, um, no meaning for, for physical objects. Um, and that's how we're kind of different than a lot of the other formats, but we, we have a lot more about uh, what are the methods that are actually going to be used to manufacture this. Um, you know, we also can include all kinds of metadata, we can include thumbnails, um, we have uh, support for, for DRM, if somebody like Disney wants to be able to print princesses, they're probably going to care how people are actually using those. Um, we aren't doing anything with that yet, but it's a possibility. It's an extensible format. You know, most importantly, basically, um, it's got the ability, being XML, it's very easy to put in metadata, it's easy to uh, define extensions that will basically make it uh, make it apply to the new things that 3D printers are bound to come out with that we haven't seen yet. All right, so that gives you a, a full picture end to end of the Microsoft printing solution. Using 3D Builder, we file printed over here to this machine that's printing out Emmett's uh, heart box. Uh, and then we went in and talked about some of the important pieces of slicing and uh, why it's so critical to, to ensuring the success of the 3D print. Uh, so for our next session, we're really going to spend some time here with Emmett and talk about the designs you see on the table and how he approached design and what you should be thinking about as a designer for building 3D models.